Okay, so welcome to the Debian derivers round, or not as quite as round table. Uh, so, let's see how this works. Um, to kind of do a little bit of an introduction, uh, there are a hundred and there are one hundred and twenty nine Debian derived distributions uh, listed on listed on the DistroWatch webpage, which means that there are uh, based on Debian, which is more than, which is the most, there are only 86 that are based on Red Hat. Uh, um, which is, which, which can be a little bit of a, which can be a little bit of a mixed blessing. It means that, it means that more people are, it, it means that more people are using Debian, but it means that many people are developing on top of Debian, but it means that many of them are doing it at, at, at a little bit of a distance. They're not doing it directly in the project. Um, some of these are, are pretty heavy, heavy distributions. They're things that look a lot more like like forks in the traditional sense. Um, and many of them are extremely minor, maybe, you know, ex extremely minor uh, derivations. I think that it may be interesting to look at derivations in terms of the, the, the types of changes that are made. There are a number, and we'll uh, talk about, and we'll talk about some of this stuff. I think that they happen on the level of package selection in terms of choosing, in choosing which software to select. Um, they happen on the level of customization and uh, configuration, very often in people that are configuring packages in different ways. They happen on the level of uh, custom environments for installation and, and, for, um, and for, you know, use in terms of different environments like uh, live CDs, like Canopics and a number of these derivatives. And then they happen on the level of code level changes and there are loads of those changes as well. So it's kind of my belief that in the near future, we're going, most people who are using Debian are going to be using Debian not directly, but through a derivation. Um, and I think that that's, and, and I think that eventually most people who are doing development will also not be doing development directly in Debian. If they, at the moment, much of the work, I don't know, maybe most of the work that happens in derivations, in all those 129 you know, derivative distributions, we haven't heard back from most of them. We do, Debian, the project, doesn't have open, you know, like good, healthy relationships with most of those derivations. Now, now, now this panel of people is, in some ways, the, the I mean, these, this, is, this is the panel of people we do have good relationships with. These are the people that are Debian developers that show up at DevConf, that, that are willing to, you know, that, that are already engaged in this conversation on Debian lists, you know, at Debian conferences. In some ways, I mean, this is exactly the group of people we don't need to reach. Um, um, uh, then again, we're in a position as people that are working both inside Debian and outside Debian. These are people that each have a foot, a foot in the project, a foot outside of the project. We're in a position to Educate the educate you know each other and the 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 larger project and the larger world of of derivations on the best ways to work with Debian while working apart um, and I think we need to help find out what that is so so I have a, a number of goals for this session um, perhaps too many uh, we'll, we'll see the first goal is that is that um, and not just for this session also for for you know moving forward one of my goals is to help. Um, Debian understand why there are so many derivations. This is the whole one size does not fit all. Um, a lot of times you hear, why don't you, just, why don't you just do your work in Debian? Why don't you just wor work on Debian? Well, well, for 130 people who have the technical capacity to, to, do, to, to derive or to build in, and to build a derivative distribution and the need to do it, some of those may be redundant to each other and to work that could be done in Debian and some of them can't. Um, I suspect that Everyone up here who has a real, re, you know, understands the value of working with Debian and working inside the project, and still finds the need to derive in one way or another. Um, so, 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 so this is so, so helping people understand that 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 Debian that, that this is a fact of life is important because because uh, I mean we need to wake up to the fact that. In terms of the Debian community, derivations are a way of life, and they're going to be an increasingly important way of life. And, and, and that kind of leads into the second issue, which is that I think we, as Debian, need to ask ourselves what it means to be 
a project in an ecosystem of distributions, right? To no longer be the one place where everything happens, but to be, you know, a, a single point in a, in a, in a, in a larger network. I, I also want to help put drivers in touch with each other because, um, because I think that working with each other is, uh, is, is something that will happen, you know, in, in working with Debian and working with each other, we can all benefit more. Um, and we can help share knowledge with each other and uh, help kind of create common solutions to common problems because I think that we'll find that a lot of the problems that people are faced with here are, 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 are shared ones. Um, I'd also like to create an open kind of venue where we can help document the processes for people who are not here to help each other. I think that if we can make it easy to derive and give back to Debian, most people will, um, or many people will, including those people that maybe don't want to come all the way to DevCom. Um, yeah, and then I just want to have these groups, both kind of like the Debian project and the drivers, uh, start talking about some of the, some of the tricky issues and, uh, and kind of start thinking about what kind of solutions we have to those. So, in that way, um, the way that I want to structure this is that I'm gonna to try to give each person about, about seven, seven or eight minutes and I'll try to, I'll try to be the, the, the clock fascist. To, 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 talk about, um, to talk about a number of questions. I w I'm gonna want everyone to up here to, to give a brief, brief description of their project um, in terms of what they do and how they do it, and also to kind of describe the, the nature of their relationship to, to the Debian project. Um, I, then, I then want people to kind of answer this question briefly of why didn't you just use Debian, right? What is it that, what is it that made you want to or need to diverge um, in whatever way that you did? Um, so th th then I'd like to kind of, then maybe I think it would be good to talk about perhaps the greatest frustration in terms of building a derivation, in terms of working with the Debian project, in terms of kind of building this, this kind of system. And then, uh, and then if anyone, if, and then if people would like, uh, maybe they could share a, a mistake or a lesson learned or something that they can help share with other derivers and with the project. So I think that um, I've got a list of a couple things that I want to be brought up, and if they're not brought up, I will <laughs> bring them up afterwards. Um, uh, so so uh, I'll, I'll probably just try to work down the line, and we'll start with uh, Dan, who's here with the HP Debian Enable. enablement. Right, okay, so I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you take it away, and I'll, I'll kind of watch the clock and make motions at you, so. All right. <laughs> How's the uh, mic working at all? Yes, no, it's okay, okay. So I'm, uh, I work in a group in HP that's called Oslo, which is, um, stands for Open Source Linux Organization, Open Source and Linux Organization. Um, we do a project uh, called HP Debian Enablement. The goal of this project is to um, provide a Debian distribution as much as it can be a Debian distribution, but also have special features mainly around hardware support um, for customers that have come and asked for the service. So I would say that probably 90% of the work we do um, up front is just adding support for new hardware, which, you know, Mako's question about why we can't just do it all within Debian is, you know, we, we want to support Sarge and we want to have Sarge security updates. We also want to have support for the latest i64 processor. So we'll often do like, like right now we're working with a, uh, we have a custom version of DI, which we just swap out the kernel, add a task package, um, and you know, it, it, it works with a new chip that's just come out for i64 platforms. Um, then the distribution beyond that, we have stuff for specific vertical markets like uh, telco environments, where um, you know, SCTP support, uh, uh, user space packages, um, uh, some stuff around IPMI, stuff like that that's mostly around hardware support or specific markets. And then we'll, um, um, over time, a, a lot of the stuff like EV logging and stuff like this isn't stuff that uh, we think the open source community really wants, stuff that wants to go back into Debian. We just have one or two customers that need it. So we don't think it's good for the overall uh, user community in a lot of cases because it would require a fork. Some other cases is stuff that we do development for and we push back. Like if we add new hardware support, we of course want the next Debian point release to support it. So we'll put those patches back into the Debian kernel project. Um, let's see, so I took notes on my hand on the questions Mako was asking. 
so that, that's why we do it. Uh, and now I can't read what I wrote. Um, that's a brief description. Why couldn't you just use Debian? That's yeah, why didn't we just use Debian? Is mainly we're just always a little bit ahead of Debian. So we need to add patches, stuff to the kernel. And then you know, a lot of the stuff we did during the Woody time frame, um, uh, we fed back in, and now we can use it in Sarge. But now we have a new platform, so now we have to do a version of Sarge that has um, a few things that are different. Um, but there's many, many reasons we want to stay working with Debian as much as possible, getting free security updates, stuff like that. Um, is definitely something that, that that's good for us. You know, it saves a lot of maintenance on our side. So your greatest frustration in terms of working with, uh, there have been any frustrating situations in terms of building your, your derivation? Um, release cycle. I mean, it's definitely the most frustrating thing. If we could put a patch into Debian and we knew like three months from now we'd have a new release out, that, that would be awesome. So it's predictability and, yes. and frequency, or both? <laughs> I would say, personally for me, yeah. Okay. Both of those two. Okay. So difficulties. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, is, oh, ooh. Mine, mine. Um, it is often asserted that, uh, in fact, I've, I've made this assertion myself based on some conversations uh, Jeff and I have had with uh, potential customers of Progeny, that um, the, the enterprise uh, users of Debian are interested in a release cycle that's fairly long, 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, do, do, you, do you feel that to be true in your experience, not just personally? Uh, not just personally, but um, in, in your dealings with the customers that, uh, that, that get your enabled product. So you're right, your, your question. Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, can yeah, you repeat maybe, the question? Maybe you can make it more concise, too. I'll, 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 I'll try to rephrase to make sure I understand what you're asking. So <coughs> you're asking about the length of maintenance of a release, if um, yeah, how, how long how a release long is maintained? Yeah, so um, essentially he's asking with the customers, we've had an experience with um, what they kind of expect in terms of length of a maintained release cycle. And actually, since we do a lot of work with telco people, you know, 18 months or whatever is very minimum. Um, we're expecting to support people like probably 10, 15, 20 years on, you know, woody bits. So it's... Uh, we don't really know how much what that means in terms of security support for a lot of customers. It changes um, in different environments, but it, you know, 15 years of supporting Woody bits is going to be so. Weird. That so the three-year release cycle is way too short. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's way too short if you're thinking. You know, we have new customers coming on board all the time. So you're going to have. So to we need new hardware at all times. So you're going you're to have to pick up security support for Woody for the next 10 years. Um, at some level, yes. At some level, okay. So that won't be as much as the security <laughs> yeah. team does, but yeah. So, right. Yeah, yeah. Hold on. There's another. Okay. Do you want to? Do you want to? Sure. Can we do a follow up first, or sure. that's cool? Well, okay. Yeah. It was just a comment that that when I first heard those kinds of numbers, they blew my mind. Yeah. And that's that's I was trying to, to draw you out on, on that particular kind of information because right. I, I think it's something most Debian developers have not heard or thought about before right. about that kind of length of time so that's really all and and I don't know that everybody's that way but yeah. oh we're well, we gonna push Bdel onto the stack I'll okay. I'll yield back is, to is it was yeah is it okay I mean you can yeah. defer to Bdel on so, right. yeah and I got to <laughs> point out that one thing that makes Brandon probably nervous about this is that Proz is doing a lot of the security support for yes. us <laughs> <laughs> so. From my perspective, it's not that big a deal. So we're the ones that are on the hook for that <laughs> 10 to 20 years. So just, just hoist it off on Indianapolis. Right. Yeah, so Dan started to say this, but I want to make sure everybody's really clear on this. It's not that they want you to release less often and have a longer <laughs> release cycle time. What, what customers really want is that when they're in the process of deciding to adopt something, they always want the latest, greatest, freshest stuff. But then they want to have control over when they have to leave that. And if it's a telco customer that's deploying a lot of machines on private nets as part of deploying mobile phone infrastructure, they don't want to touch the machines at all, updates or anything, for like five years after they turn them on. And so it's an entirely different set of expectations. But all over the place, embedded systems developers are even worse. Um, they, you know, when they're building a new product, they want the absolute latest, greatest bits. 
and then they don't want those bits to change until they do another product cycle. And so the, the length of the bit, you know, the, the, the life cycle of the bits has to be the life cycle of their product or their deployment or whatever. And this is where, for a company like HP, there is actually a business opportunity around the notion of, um, you know, people are sometimes willing to pay for that length of support and for the stuff that goes with it. Okay. So j I want to yield back to one person, and then we should move on. Um, so you said, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're going to be supp supporting Woody for more or less another eight years? A subset of Woody with some bits changed, and we'll be supporting it at you know, some level for you know, probably 15, 20 years. On what level would it be possible to make this available to the general public? It is available to the general public, but what's available isn't usually um, desired by the general public. Um, so I can point you to a server called hpde.linux.hp.com, which has these bits there. Right now, they are um, mostly IA64. Actually, all er, everything we put out so far is IA64 based. Um, so, for example, Woody, when it shipped um, well, on IA64, it had 2417 kernel and stuff like that, and we've upped it to uh, 2425 in one flavor and a 2420 that's heavily patched in another. Um, so this stuff works very well for the customers that, that want it, but we haven't. We, we haven't had many requests for things beyond uh, this type of environment. Okay, so we won't be announcing Woody's security support for another 10 years tomorrow. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Thanks. And in fact, you know, we have a specific set of customers mapped to each release. So if a set of customers say, we don't want security anymore, well, we're probably going to drop security support. It, it's, not, it's not generally available in that sense. So, so just one other, one other thing that you said that I kind of maybe want to draw out is that you mentioned that it was a subset of Woody. So you're not yes. supporting. So, so how, how big of a so, so, so selection of ter in terms of what you're supporting is an important, is an important aspect. So you have longer release yeah. cycles, but smaller subset. How, how big is right. your subset? Just um, packages? Brandon might know more about this in the, Woody subs in the Woody subset. How much of it is actually Woody? Do you know? Oh, well. <laughs> I would say like. How many total packages? 50% of it. I, it did, what that, you're talking about HPDE1, right? Yeah. So oh, I, that's this, oh, it's an obnoxious hybrid of Woody and Sarge yeah. as of 2003. I so mean, you've got a, okay, so yeah. you've got quasi so Woody. Yeah. How, 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 big, how, how big is it, how big is it total, just to get an idea? I'd probably say 700 packages. 700, okay. Yeah, it was, it was just over one CD's worth, I think. Okay. So in terms of megabytes, it's, okay. it's probably about seven or 800 megs. And we are actually moving to keep that smaller as releases go. Yes. So the new stuff based on Sarge um, is probably closer to 300 packages. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's considerably leaner. OK. All right, well, just before, before I cut you off, um, is there any mistake or lesson learned or something that you would want to share? There's a lot of release process mistakes that um, we made inside of HP as far as just maintenance. So we like forking off all these. One, we have like a 1.0 release based on Woody, a 1.2 release based on Woody. Or when I say release, I mean streams. Um, and over time, uh, we just let it balloon too much. And Brandon would probably agree with me that we started backporting a lot of stuff from Sarge because we thought it would make more sense. So, you know, maybe, maybe in short, the biggest mistake was uh, splitting off too much from Debian. And, and how, and how many people do you have working on the project? Um, within Progeny, I don't know. Um, within HP, most of the people we have is doing development of features in like the kernel. And I would say probably you know, 10 people there. Okay. Um, and as far as release maintenance inside of HP, two of us. And then working with Progeny to do a lot of the rest. Okay. All right, great. So uh, we can come back for questions for the whole group. So we can try to keep things moving. So I'm going to move to the next one. Do you want to talk about embedded, right, embedded Debian? Yeah. Um, Hi, I'm Wookie. Um, I've actually done this twice. Um, once was uh, LF Arm Linux, which is one of these micro, um, incredibly trivial um, derived distributions. So that was just making things work properly on the Acorn RISC PCs, um, uh, circa 2001, I think. Um, and that's easy. You know, you just update a few packages because they currently don't work, like the installer was broken, um, and use Debian CD to make a, a slightly different unofficial CD. And, uh, Basically, all those changes can go back into Debian, but um, like you said, uh, in the interest of getting something released now, you just do your version, and then you worry about shipping them back upstream in due course, um, and they work their way through the system. 
So that's fairly painless. Um, but these days, that's defunct. Um, and uh, I'm interested in, in embedded Debian. Now, it's not actually a distribution at the moment. We haven't got that far. Uh, it's a load of tools that sort of work uh, and some principles um, which we'll talk about later today. Um, but uh, the idea is that we can use the multiple architectures Debian supports and the consistent code base to make nice, neat, small distributions as opposed to massive desktop and server distributions. Um, why can't we just use Debian as it stands? Well, because it's designed for desktops and it's fat and huge and um, monstrous and full of stuff that you don't want on embedded systems like documentations and 57 languages and all sorts of stuff. Uh, you know, we want 64 meg system images, not a gigabyte. Um, so it's quite different. Now, it may be the case, in fact, that it's so different that trying to derive it from Debian isn't practical and this isn't fully determined. Uh, we're in the process of trying to do it to see whether it makes sense, or in fact it's just a dumb idea. Um, the things that we need to kind of deal with Debian about is, is basically persuading all you guys that cross-compiling matters. Uh, obviously Debian is entirely natively compiled at the moment and built because that works. Um, but in embedded land, people need to cross-compile, and arguably for our existing stuff, especially some of the more ancient architectures that are unbelievably slow, it might actually be useful to cross-build those um, so you didn't have to wait four days for uh, OpenOffice to build an ARM and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, in the w same way that we've made everything work uh, across lots of architectures and fixed an awful lot of bugs over the years because of that, um, we could, in principle, make everything cross-build properly. Uh, all the technology exists, it's all horribly complicated. Um, and it would probably improve, it would improve everybody's code, it would improve Debian and it would go back upstream to, to fix everything else. So that's the kind of, that's why I think it will be, it will be fun to do. Um, but for that to work, there has to be quite a lot of buy-in from everybody that this is actually worth doing. Um, what else? Uh, Debian installer is, in effect, uh, one possible instance of embedded Debian. You know, it's um, a small distribution for a particular purpose derived from the Debian code base. Now, that's exactly what everybody wants to do for whatever their particular purpose is. Uh, obviously, Debian installer is particularly closely tied to Debian, and most will be less so. But uh, uh, the idea is that we could do lots of things like that. Um, biggest problem uh, at the moment is... To make this work, uh, we have to mess with the tools like dpackage um, and dpackage cross and dpackage dev and deb helper and all that kind of stuff. And so we go, oh, what we want to do is this, and we change all our tools. And then um, while we're all sitting around not doing anything fast enough, everything changes in Debian, it stops working. So um, uh, as I'll explain this afternoon, we all had it working in February, and everything's moved on again, and now our tools have got out of sync. Um, um, you know, that's the biggest problem, is that there aren't enough people working on it fast enough to keep up with Debian. Uh, <laughs> and that makes us go even slower. I think that's probably all I... You mentioned, so, so to kind of reiterate something else that I, kind of, I, thought, I thought I heard was that uh, perhaps their frustration is convincing lots of people in the project. If you've got a, a major change that you think would be a good idea that would enable you to do more things, something like, you know, uh, making cross-compiling more, you know, easier. What else did you mention? Uh, I and, Adele, oh, actually, one thing I forgot to say is that um, the reason why we can't use Debian is that uh, the embedded things are very different. You know, we want smaller package granularity in a lot of cases because you don't always want, you know, Debian basically by default compiles, builds things with everything that it can do built in. And often on an embedded system, you want to build it with some of the things it can do built in. You know, you might want the X version or you might just want the cursed version, and you don't want both. And often those are all in the same package. So to make it work, you need to split things up into more packages um, and, always, and always split the docs off and all that kind of, you know, basically a finer package granularity works a lot better. And, and a lot of those changes are quite intrusive. Um, so we either have to maintain them separately, which makes embedded Debian very different, uh, we have to persuade Debian that this is, this is generally useful, um, in which case it's a lot easier to maintain. But it, you know, 
it affects every um, every package you're out there. I think that's a problem that we'll probably hear more of in this idea of kind of how do you persuade the project that something would be a useful thing. Indeed. Uh, um, even to a large group of people. So maybe that's a maybe that's a problem that we'll hear again. So um, yeah, there's a question. Wait for them. Oh, <laughs> As far as I remember, there were a lot of bugs about uh, making some packages uh, able to cross-compile. Um, do you have any insight how the experience was with this? Is, is this working good, or has there been some uh, yeah, regulation from above to uh, keep the maintainers applying these patches? That there um, were, that I don't were know. There? I, I'm not aware that people have been uh, um, sending in lots of patches. I know, for example, there's a bin utils cross-compiling patch, which was, was various iterations have been submitted over the last year and a half or something. It hasn't actually made it into the main package yet for no particularly obvious reason. Um, so now, you know, we get the impression that people aren't particularly inspired. Yeah, and, and to be fair, I, I can see why. You know, it's not something that really concerns them at the moment. It's not a big issue for Debian. And we need to make it so if we're going to succeed in that particular debate so right I mean everyone is you know th there's this situation where everyone is welcome to file as many patches with wish list bugs as you want mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that anyone will need, needs to apply them um, and in situations where the benefit isn't directly obvious to the to the Debian maintainer I mean I guess perhaps something that the, the that I'd like people to realize is that is that sometimes a closer relationship with a drive distribution can ultimately be a be very beneficial thing. So in situations where it doesn't change the default behavior or, or alter things, maybe applying that patch to minimize that delta over time is going to be a useful thing in and of itself. So if you want to, Jeff, we can next, the next, so. Was there another question? Yeah. Oh, one more question, sorry. Okay. That's a comment. Yeah. Uh, Do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, could you please, people, introduce yourself, please? Because I'm not sure. I, I mostly know yourself, but I'm not sure everyone around knows about your names and so on and so on. So I think it would be nice of you. Sure, let's yeah. do it. So, so cool. yeah, that's a, I apologize so. for not doing that before. Um, so I'm Benjamin Mako Hill. I work. I worked on Ubuntu and on Debian nonprofit, and uh, probably had my hands in some other troublemaking. Um, so yeah. I'm I'm Dan Frazier. Um, I work at HP, and um, most everything I've done has been around the Debian enablement stuff, um, as far as CDDs are concerned. So, uh, I'm Wookie. I, I work at Aleph One. Um, we basically do ARM Linux consulting, um, and on my personal main interest at the moment is embedded Debian. My name is Jeff Laquia. I work for Progeny, and I'll get more into what that means in a few minutes. My name is Peter Reynoldsen. I'm uh, involved in the School Linux Debian EDU effort and a few other projects. My name is Andreas Tiller, and I initiated the Debian Med uh, project, which is basically a support uh, medical application inside Debian. I'm Matt Zimmerman, and uh, I'm representing Ubuntu here. My name is Roger So. Um, I work for Songhua Linux, which is in Hong Kong and in China. We focus on a desktop there have been distribution. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> All right. OK, just come have a, have a share. It's fine. There's one here. Do you want to introduce yourself quickly? Or? No, apart from being late, I'm Simon Holman. I work for VA Linux. Um, amongst other things, we're doing a bunch of application servers based on Debian. All right, well, first this. <laughs> <laughs> it works for... I'll, uh, I'll speak slower now. Um, I work for VA Linux in Japan, and we do application servers based on Debian. We also do a lot of other things. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay, so Jeff, now I'll let you have the floor. As I mentioned, my name is Jeff Laquia. I work for Progeny uh, in Indianapolis. Uh, Progeny's relationship with Debian is pretty strong. Uh, the founder of Progeny, Ian Murdoch, is also the founder of Debian, and if you will, the Ian in Debian. 
Um, so obviously we have a long and uh, pretty strong relationship with uh, Debbie and a strong affinity towards Debbie as well. Uh, in the beginning, we did a, uh, a Debian derived distribution called Progeny Debian. Uh, that went as well as, you know, it seemed to go pretty well. Uh, nowadays, our business is focused on customizing Debian or customizing distributions in general, doing custom distributions for various uh, of our customers. Uh, we found that a lot of people out in the world are interested in using Linux uh, for various applications. Uh, but most of them tend to f want to focus on one particular part of the problem. So if you're, um, if you're doing, say, a media center, you might be really, really, really interested in your, um, in your video codecs and audio codecs and mPlayer and uh, MythTV and stuff like that. But, you know, core utils and libc and stuff like that, oh, you know, whatever. I, yeah, I guess I have to deal with that. Um, one of the things we do is we allow people to outsource those parts of their, um, their efforts, um, things like security updates and making sure that all their stuff works together. Um, they can allow us to do it. We provide them with the basic pieces of a distribution that's customized to meet whatever their particular need is, and then they put their stuff on top of it. Um, I think HPDE was mentioned as one example of someone who we, we've uh, been successful in doing that with. Um, let me think. Um, there's been a lot in some cases of what I'll call a negative perception towards Debian or a negative sort of attitude about Debian. I think a lot of people are a little bummed about the Sarge release process and so I want to take a minute and instead of talking about something where, you know, something that irritates me about Debian, I wanted to talk about something that's actually really good that Debian does well that other people would do well to emulate. Um, because of the nature of the market, we not only do Debian distributions, but we also do uh, distributions based on Red Hat uh, and other RPM-based systems for some of our customers. And I have to tell you that whenever, you know, obviously we like customers and we like the, uh, we, we like the relationships that we have, and of course we'll do whatever people will pay us to do. I'm sure you're all familiar with how that works. Um, but when we find out that there's another Red Hat RPM-based distribution that we have to do, uh, we all kind of groan, groan yes. Um, because of the unique nature of Debian, the fact that we do not have some grand overlord, Brandon accepted, of course, um, we do not have some grand overlord standing over us telling us that we must cooperate in certain ways. You know, we don't have managers who can walk in and say, I want this done now, darn it and who can threaten our paychecks if, they, if we don't. Uh, Debian has been forced to create an infrastructure that in my opinion is second to none in terms of uh, building distributions in a uh, transparent and open and scalable way. Um, for all of the problems that we had in the Sarge release uh, and for all of the, the difficulties, uh, they would not, they would be much, much worse if we were forced, for example, to use the publicly available infrastructure that is out there for RPM-based distributions, most of which is non-existent, non-documented, or very kludgy and otherwise thrown together by people who are just trying to duplicate whatever it is that Red Hat does internally to themselves. Um, so that was, that's something that I think is important for us to keep in mind is that while our processes are not perfect, they <coughs> certainly have their advantages, and I think that that will continue to be the case. Uh, at least that's been my experience. Um, in terms of lessons learned, I think I would have to echo what Dan said. Um, to the extent that any derivative uh, deviates from the Debian, from real live Debian, it is usually to their disadvantage. Uh, they'll end up paying for it later. Um, it's been our experience that while, of course, obviously, you know, if, if, if we didn't have to make any changes, we would just use Debian. Um, so if we, um, so obviously if we um, use, um, it, so we have to make some changes. Um, but to the extent that we make changes sort of gratuitously, where, you know, we cannot identify an actual need for an actual patch to a package that is in Debian. Uh, that later tends to bite us. We tend to we end up having to maintain it over a long period of time, and that ends up taking a lot of time that we could probably put to more productive use. So one of the things that we've learned inside Progeny is that whenever we do whenever we do make changes, 
uh, that we have a very clear documented need for it. Um, I think I've um, covered why we do, why we don't just use Debian. Um, I think that the reason that we don't just give people Debian is that most people take a look at Debian and they see this, you know, 14 CDs worth of binary packages and they say, oh my gosh, what is this? And they, they tend to get overwhelmed. One of the services that we can provide is that we can tell people, okay, look, you got 14 CDs worth of binaries, but really all you need, all you absolutely have to have is this very small subset. And then you can pull the rest, the stuff that you need out of the rest as you need it. So, um. Um, so let me see if I have anything that you didn't cover. Any, any lessons learned, hard lessons learned? You covered the rest. Um, lessons learned. Um, communication is very important. Um, being in touch with the people. If we're, if Progeny is taking a bunch of stuff and we're sort of making a business out of taking all your stuff and selling it to people, um, there's, I think, a bit of an uh, obligation that we have to keep our communication open and to give back to you, to the rest of the community. Uh, to the extent that you do that, any uh, to the extent any derivative does that, I think that that will make, it's been our experience anyway, that that will make your relationship with Debian a lot better. So, you know, telling people that you're doing something to their package, sending them a patch, explaining why you did the patch and what benefits that patch gives you, not just sort of, you know, uh, putting a package out there anonymously that's changed and you know the package maintainer hears about it later because some poor soul has got a bug and they go to the Debian people instead of to us and you know the maintainer is like what the heck is this what this guy do what are these progeny people smoking you know um, so to the extent now obviously we're not perfect and we have our communications issues as I'm sure everyone does but to the extent that we can we think that uh, communication is essential so communication with the project, that sounds good. Um, something else that you kind of said that I maybe want to highlight is that it sounds like you guys are, you've got kind of a derivative of Debian, and then you're also doing derivatives of that, which you are, would, so, so I mean, is that, is that kind of accurate, or? Yes, that's correct. I should have brought that up before. Um, we have sort of two, um, two a two-pronged front to this. First of all, we do, right now we do custom distribution sort of on an ad hoc basis. You come to us, you tell us, you know, you give us like, maybe you've already derived a distribution and you want, you need help maintaining it, uh, and we'll do that for you. We also are starting an initiative to make it easier for people to derive off of Debian called Componentized Linux, uh, which you can find out more about at componentizedlinux.org. Um, we're also building a tool set to try and make it easier to do derived distributions um, and other, other efforts basically aimed at making uh, customization um, of Debian and also possibly in the future of RPM-based distributions a lot easier. Okay, I just, I just kind of wanted to highlight that because I think that we'll hear about this again and it's this interesting idea of, so, so when I talked about that ecosystem, you know, it's easy to think of it as a, as a, like a wheel with Debian in the middle, and then lots of spokes out there. But I think that increasingly often, it's becoming much more complex in that there are now derivative distributions with derivative distributions, and, and, and who knows, maybe there'll be derivative distributions of derivative distributions, you know, derivative distributions. And then, and, and, and kind of, I mean, that, in some ways, that makes your role increasingly important um, in this ecosystem. And in some ways, it kind of just makes this a little more complicated in ways we should think about, so. Definitely. Yeah. All right, so, so maybe, Petter, I'll let you. Yes, as I said, I'm Petter Reynoldsen. I work with uh, the School Linux Debian EDU project. Uh, we are trying to make a Debian distribution for uh, schools, targeted for the uh, pupils network in schools. Actually, we are trying to spread Linux into the schools. We are not really want, wishing to be a distribution maker. But uh, we had this vision of an uh, out-of-the-box solution for um, schools, and um, it was not available, so we had to make it ourselves. Um, we are uh, heavily involved in the Debian installer effort in Debian. We uh, took over the project uh, when, uh, well, just after Woody was released. We have been doing one release based on Woody and are now working on a Sarge-based release. We try to put everything we need back into Debian, but 
when we don't succeed, we need to add some extra packages. The reason is, of course, we don't want to maintain software. We want to spread Linux. Um, we have also been involved in the uh, testing security team effort and um, also have provided a few fixes and patches to a lot of packages we need. We started with the Woody based version with approximately 900 packages um, where I think 30 or 40 were special packages not in Woody. And I think when we get the Sarge version out, we should have approximately the same number of packages, but, but only less than 10 special packages for, um, for school Linux. Uh, <clears throat> and I guess the answer to the question why not Debian is that Debian was not doing what we wanted. We provide a set of services, 15 services that work out of the box, pre-configured and they integrated together uh, on a simple installation or from a simple installation a CD. We also provide a workstation profile that will connect to this server and uh, work flawlessly with uh, home directories uh, mounted on all the uh, workstations with uh, email working, with uh, clock synchronization, centralized logging, uh, common user database, uh, single sign-on and all that kind of thing that's working out of the box. This was not possible to do with Debian without a lot of manual work and uh, when you want um, as I do, my religions teacher to be able to uh, install uh, Debian pre-configured to work out the box in the schools. You cannot give them a 200 page manual, go through all these configuration files and fix this stuff and then it works nicely because they will just find something else to do. Um, as for our work within Debian, we have seven Debian develop developers I think on the project and approximately two hundred contributors in one level or, or another. We have been working quite a lot on translate translations and most of the contributors are translators. Um, we have tried to push our changes back into Debian as far as we can. Of course some project participate uh, project members are better than to do this than others um, and we also have um, experienced that some Debian developers are easier to approach and get them to include our fixes than others. I think that's the main issue we have with Debian, talking to Debian maintainers and, uh, well, getting response from Debian maintainers. If you actually get them to talk, it's a lot easier to get communication going, but when you send off a bug report and try to explain why you need things and nothing happens at all for two or three years, it's a bit painful. It's, it's a bit painful even when you're not a driver, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, luckily, that's not the uh, common case, but in uh, some cases, that's uh, uh, an important part we need to have fixed, and we don't get any uh, communication going. Uh, another thing uh, we would really like to get more help on is to uh, make the packages uh, install time configurable. Uh, we are configuring at install time. We do not want to ask anyone to modify the configuration file after the installation. And, uh, the method we have come up with so far is preceding, which is in the normal Debian installation system, and the multi-level configuration, which is uh, another feature, but has, that has to be coordinated with upstream, of course, so um, it's, um, it's more complicated to get it in. And as a last resort, we just modify the configuration file of other packages to get them to do what we want, but then we break upgradability, so it's not a preferred option. So we would really like to get all you Debian developers to make your packages more configurable at install time and don't say, oh, the system administrator can just modify this uh, when the system is installed because it's not an option when you have 2,000 machines to uh, tell one system administrator with uh, two to four hours a week to work on computers to do configuration of these machines. That doesn't work. Uh, another problem we have uh, experienced is not really a Debian problem as such, but it's a problem with free software. Uh, we are missing a few key free software pieces. Uh, Java and Flash seem to be the highest profile software missing. We, in Norway at least, have all the uh, national tests in schools done on Flash, and uh, we would really like to provide a complete solution with free software 
and when we have to tell the schools to use Macromedia Flash, it's not really a good feeling. Uh, the same with Java. Java applets are used quite a lot in schools to demonstrate smaller educational uh, topics, and when there is no free app applet viewer that works, and well, that there is no free secure applet viewer that works, it's not really uh, convenient to tell them to use free software. So please help the Java community and help the uh, Flash community to get free tools available. Um, another minor issue is that we have uh, 900 packages we want to put on our CD. Uh, some of them do not make it into the uh, stable release and we have continuously needed to keep track of all the packages and find out, uh, oh, it's been thrown out by the release team and try to find out why and try to get it back in. And it's, we've missed a few packages. Celestia was a really nice packet that was thrown out of, um, of Sarge. We didn't discover it before Sarge was released, so it's not in Sarge. Um, yeah, so that's at least one, one point where we need to do a better job uh, in the future, keeping track of the patches and make sure they actually make it into Edge at least. Um, one problem we also discovered was that we spent a lot of time talking to maintainers of packages, got them to include the configuration op options we needed to get them installed properly, and then the maintainer changed and the configuration was thrown out again, and we didn't discover until a bit later and never had the time to actually try to get it back in again. So we need to keep track of all the packages we need to have configured and make sure they stay configurable if you have been so successful to get them configurable at install time. And um, we haven't done a great job there either because it takes a lot of time to talk to, um, talk to maintainers. Did I forget anything? I think that's, I think that's, that's a pretty good cover so we can probably, yeah. Andres can fill in any gaps here. I think there's a question over Oh, there. yeah, there's a question. Um, are there two, two questions? Who was, where was the other one? One up there? Oh, three questions. Okay. Okay. Should I begin, Chess? Yeah, let's do. Okay. Um, are there any obvious or uh, kind of trivial ways in which Debian could improve the trackability? Uh, so you um, said you had problems to keep track with packages and with changes, and when they get thrown out of the release, and is, uh, um, is this mainly a problem of manpower on your side, or are there really some tools missing uh, in Debian to uh, make this easier? Um, or, or are there tools missing, but you don't know really how they should look? So it's We have made a few tools to keep track of the packet lists, and I don't think the main problem is lack of tools. Uh, of course, better tools to make sure we get more faster notification of the packages going, being thrown out of the testing and stuff like that would help. But the main problem is when we do discover that the packet has been thrown out, we need to put man hours on our side to get in touch with the people on the, like the maintainer side and get man hours from the maintainer side and talk together and try to get it fixed. So it's a manpower question more than a technical question. At a, at a, I mean, at a, at a certain point, a lot of these problems come down to, you know, conversations with the maintainer or working with people on a maintainer by maintainer basis. And, and the problem with that is that even if you're maintaining 800 packages, we may be talking about, you know, 400, 500 maintainers in Debian, but on a project with five people, you know, the, 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 I don't know, the, 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 the balance there is a little off, you know, you know, if those 500 people can each spend, you know, 20 minutes, you know, of their day emailing that, but but the, the five people, two five hundred, can be really really tricky. Um, and and maybe finding ways to streamline this so that so we should maybe be thinking of ways to to streamline this so that small groups of people can kind of communicate with the uh, Debian and you know trying to f solve problems that maybe can avoid a lot of these conversations as well. So we and, have and to put in more comments on that. Uh, the latest effort we are doing is to get a better thin client support or actually a different thin client support into Debian called LTSP. And uh, this involves kernel work, X work, and hardware detection work. And if we don't have some features in the kernel that affects like 10 other packages which need to do 
redirection of files which can no longer be in ETC because they are in, put into a temp file system or something like that. So it's like coordinating work with 15, 20 maintainers in Debian and convincing them that this is a good idea. It's a lot of work. Yeah, especially if one person can stop, hold up the show. Yeah. So. Um, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> All right. Um, being a high school student and a de Debian developer at the same time, I've had to encounter many of the obstacles that are associated with only using Linux on your laptop, which has been the case for several years for me. Um, so there's, for example, um, at my school, I had a bunch of textbooks where they came, came with CDs that required stuff like Internet Explorer specific stuff. They would block out Netscape and Mozilla and things that used um, a Macromedia's director to demonstrate things. And I'm wondering, um, first of all, um, how School Linux is prepared to approach that kind of problem because you can't, it's kind of hard to petition the people who make textbooks and stuff like that to, to not do that kind of thing and present a more independent architecture independent solution. Um, and secondly, um, are there any ways you can get around those kinds of problems like the Internet Explorer stipulations that many things like these require? I so can only talk we about. We can answer this briefly because we got to keep going. But, okay. but yeah, uh, I don't think it's that hard to get the uh, well, let's call them uh, creators to uh, change their behavior because uh, when you have a lot of schools, we have approximately 200 schools, I think, in Norway at the moment, and then we are a major <coughs> force factor in the educational sector. They can no longer ignore 200 schools not being a able to use their uh, software, not being able to look at their web page, and not being able to do the national tests. So the uh, vendors have to modify their pages to get them working with Linux. And uh, it's just a question of numbers. If you have your um, big enough minority behind you, they can no longer ignore you. Okay. So we have. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So we've got another question. Um, I'm wondering, uh, do you think it's feasible to use debconf to configure all the packages on the system for your customization needs? And do you think it's a tool that was designed to do that? Because that's what you're, you're try you want to do, right? Uh, yes, I believe it's uh, possible and uh, quite feasible to, uh, actually quite well-designed tool to do uh, configuration at install time, yes. For complex, what? even for complex things like complex configuration files, you think you can fit everything in debconf questions? Uh, yes, to some degree. I would uh, add on uh, multi-level configuration, so you redirect uh, the uh, configuration to a different file that has been provided by the uh, installation overrides. Hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, moving on. Andres from the kind of do the oh. oh. There's a school of Linux meeting oh, okay. on Thursday at 18 o'clock in the hack lab, in the room behind Perfect. the hack lab. So everybody who wants to join us is invited. Excellent, excellent, thanks. So, so now, Andreas, maybe you can kind of give us a little bit of the custom Debian distribution angle. Okay, uh, I'm Andreas Tiller. I uh, just initiated the Debian Mate project, which uh, leads uh, many people to the conclusion that I'm uh, a doctor or whatever, no, I'm not. I'm a physicist and I was Debian de developer before I entered the Medical Institute where I'm working now and I'm just hoping to convince my colleagues that um, medical software is available under Linux and it is a good thing. So, uh, I also do some general uh, custom Debian distribution uh, stuff and I uh, might uh, like to say something uh, before because uh, you might conclude it from my accent. I'm a German, and German people are uh, known as uh, always be whining about things which do not work. Uh, <laughs> this, this is not the problem, because the things which work are fine. There is no task to do, because it is fine. We have not to change it. We have to change the things which are not good, and that's why I'm talking about things which are not good. And don't think I'm an off-putting person. I, I see the good things, and I know the good things, but I will not talk about them. So <laughs> Germans are seeking new jobs. 
for instance, if you look at uh, the 129 uh, derivatives from Debian and only 68 from Red Hat or whatever, and say, oh, it is good, Debian is flexible. But well, I can say, oh, it is bad because 129 people think Debian is not good enough for me, but only 68 people think Red Hat is not good for me. And so there are more people who think Debian is not good because they have a reason to enhance it. And so I want to reduce the reason to enhance Debian in making it better. So it's no whining. I'm just looking for things we, we can do better inside Debian. So my reason to, to go to Debian Met was that I uh, learned that there is no critical mass of developers of this special field. The people don't know each other. They are working in separate. And I think they, they got not really the idea of free software, how to work with it. They just thought, oh, it's free. I can take it, change it, and do whatever I wanted. It is possible, but it is not a good thing. And my idea is to be that the Debian developers should be the missing link between upstream and uh, the users. So there, there is a missing link because all these developers of free medical software were able to use their own software perfectly, but they had no users because there was no usability. The, the programs even were not known in the world. And so people reinvented the wheel over and over. That's why I started the Debian Mid project. We are one of the first custom Debian distributions, only the Debian Junior was uh, before. Uh, Debian met and my intention is now to find out which um, projects could be come back to Debian. I was very happy uh, two years ago in, in Oslo there was Scholar Linux and Debian Edu something different and um, I had my CDD talk and I was uh, asked or, or I asked Peter why Scholar Linux doesn't work with Debian Edu. And he said, well, Debian Edu is dead. They do not working. And so I s told him, well, take it over. It's yours. And so we have one custom Debian distribution more, more because just somebody stepped in and took the right step to make Debian better instead making a separate distribution. And so I think this is the main purpose. We, we, we sh should only derive from Debian if there is really a reason and if the reason is that Debian is bad, this is no reason. It would be better to make Debian good for this, what I want to do with Debian, so it's a special purpose. A special purpose might be uh, serving teachers or serving uh, um, even children for Debian Junior or Debian made for the uh, medical stuff or whatever we have. And so uh, my idea of custom Debian distributions is make Debian better and make it in the same technical fashion. As I said, I'm a physicist. Well, physicists have two uh, main uh, things in common. They are lazy on one hand, and they are not really technical skilled as uh, informaticians. I, I can say it, I, I know I'm, I can make something working, but uh, if an informatician looks at it, it looks bad, I know that. So wh what I did is I started writing this CDD toolkit and I know I have to make it good enough that people work with it, but I have to make it bad enough that uh, some informatician steps in and said, oh, I want to make it better. And it worked. And people helped me, and the, the stuff became better now, and it will even become better because uh, Sergio talens Oleg is now rewriting it to make it a really good tool to have a common technical base for all custom Debian distribution. In my opinion, it is a very important thing, thing to unify on a technical basis because reinventing the wheel is, is always a bad thing. And that's why I hope many people try to get the idea of the custom distrib Debian distribution and use these technical tools to enhance them together. Because as I said, I'm a lazy person. I do not want to make to build this custom Debian distribution for my Debian made stuff. I hope that other people will do it for me who are more skilled than me. I just want to have the workload to those people who, who, who can really do it. And I want to concentrate on the things I can do. Just care for the medical applications. And once this CDD toolkit is, is ready, you will 
perhaps not see me on the CDD front anymore, but only on the Debian made stuff. So, and on Saturday is a Debian made day. I want to get this more involved with people who are interested in. So, so thanks for the the kind of talk about Debian Med and also about the, the, the CDD stuff. CDDs occupy an interesting space because they're trying to work fully within the Debian project in a way that not all derivatives can do, but that when derivatives can work in that way, it's it certainly seems like the ideal way to do it. And kind of unifying around tools is maybe useful not just for providing a common basis in the CDD world, but maybe creating tools that derivatives outside of Debian can use as well to kind of help merge their changes back. Cool. All right. Uh, are there questions uh, about that? Or there's one. Where? No? No? There's pointing. But I don't see where it's. It was quite in the middle over there. <laughs> yeah, can you raise your hand if you have a question? No, I think there's just pointing to nowhere. Okay. Uh, uh, um, um, all right. So uh, I'll point to the uh, to the to the to the next speaker, Matt uh, Matt Zimmerman from Ubuntu. Right. Yeah. Sure. Hello. Excellent. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Is it on? Okay, um, again, I'm Matt Zimmerman, and I'm here to, I'm going to talk a little bit about our experience uh, with the Ubuntu distribution, building it and working with the community and, and with Debian. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have already heard uh, quite a bit about, about the project or, and, and are quite familiar with it, but uh, I'll try to give a brief outline of, of what we do, for the, both for those of you who are not familiar and uh, maybe to stimulate some discussion around those points. Um, we, take, we have a distribution based on Debian Unstable. Uh, all of the packages in Debian Unstable are also a part of Ubuntu. Um, however, uh, we make independent time-based releases uh, based on those packages. So every six months there's a new release of Ubuntu and it's supported for 18 months after that. Uh, we have uh, a lot of visibility within the desktop community because that's where we do some of our work, but uh, it's really a, a general purpose distribution. Um, we've received a lot of attention in the community recently uh, because there's been a lot of activity uh, in the user and developer communities around Ubuntu. It's something that uh, has caught a lot of people's interest and we're very happy about that but at the same time it's uh, it can be a challenge to, mal to manage uh, very fast growth, li growth like that especially when you're trying to collaborate with other projects within the open source community. Um, some of the things that we do are different to the way that other Debian derivatives work uh, and custom distributions. So a few of those things uh, are a bit technical. Uh, for example, we have an, a complete separate package archive uh, where we keep all of our uh, packages and work with them uh, rather than using the Debian archive and perhaps layering some additional packages on top of that. Um, and we have an independent uh, build infrastructure where we build all of our packages and uh, sort of parallel the same infrastructure that Debian uses for their own work. Uh, so we bring in source code from Debian and uh, occasionally it's modified and it's built and provided in a package archive in the same way that Debian does. Um, some of the reasons, uh, to answer I guess the why not Debian uh, question, um, a big part of that is uh, the re our release process, which I just described. Um, it's very important to us to be, be able to provide a predictable uh, release cycle. Uh, we, the community uh, has spoken very strongly on this in the past. This is something that a lot of people are interested in seeing, and, and especially for a distribution based on Debian. Um, and it's also important to us to be able to uh, kind of push new features uh, in some uh, sometimes without interfering with the work that Debian is doing. So while, De while Debian may be stabilizing for a release, uh, we may be in a period of aggressive feature development uh, leading up to a much, uh, to a, a release after Debian. Um, in order to do what we do, we, we uh, accept some trade-offs relative to what Debian is doing. Uh, Debian is obviously a very large collection of software, a very general purpose distribution that a lot of people are able to apply to what they want. Um, Ubuntu, uh, on the other hand, we tend to focus the work that we do on a smaller subset uh, of the package archive. So while we provide every all the same software that Debian does, um, we do most of the things that the, the work that we do independent of Debian uh, has to do with a, a relatively small subset of that, uh, which is also true for for a lot of derived distributions. 
Um, we also support a more limited range of hardware architectures, which enables us to you know, be more efficient in some ways and uh, focus on where we think, what we think our users want uh, the most. Um, we, in terms of some of the frustrations, I guess that we've experienced, obviously the they also kind of fall into the general category of communicating with Debian. Debian has shown itself to be, um, while a technically excellent uh, community and a very valuable um, organization to the open source world, very difficult to communicate with. Um, Debian, you know, is not does not have one mind or one voice. They're all independent uh, developers. All of us are, and we all have our own opinions about the way that things should work. Uh, and so it's very difficult for a derivative distribution to really approach Debian with an idea unless it's very compartmentalized and it's something that you can talk to a specific person or, or team about. Um, and in terms of getting consensus across, the, across an organization about a, a big idea, um, that can be, can be a very challenging process. As anyone who has participated in the Debian development list knows there could be a, a lot of strong emotions around uh, both technical and, and social issues. Um, it's also been... Uh, and this is, and this, is, this is with Debian. I mean, these are all Debian people bringing, is bringing things to... I mean, in, in the case of Ubuntu, the people that are bringing, these issue, bringing maybe suggestions or something maybe with Debian people. I mean, I'm just thinking in terms of distributions that have no people involved with Debian at all, the person comes on the mailing list and maybe suggests something relatively controversial that could be even that much more difficult. Right, so, exactly. I mean, we're in a position where there's... Uh, Quite a bit of overlap between the Ubuntu and Debian communities. A lot of several developers are part of, uh, are involved with both projects, and so are accustomed to some of the peculiarities that Debian has um, in this way. And even so, that's uh, it's been been a great challenge to try to tr try to do the right thing by the community and uh, get get things happening in the way that we all want. Um, lessons learned. Um, people have very strong opinions about their desktop artwork. Um, <laughs> but apart from that, it's been, uh, we've definitely learned that uh, there are a lot of people out there who really, who love Debian very much, are very passionate about, passionate about it, but um, they want something that's a little bit different, a little bit closer to what they want. And I want to reemphasize what, uh, what Mako has said about this, this idea of an ecosystem of distributions. Um, I don't think that uh, derivatives should be seen as a criticism of Debian necessarily. It shouldn't that they're not bugs. Um, mm. It's by creating places like this where more specialized work can happen or where new ideas can be tried out, I think we stimulate development a lot. And if we say that you know, derivatives shouldn't exist or that we should minimize deriv derivatives, I think that stifles development by forcing everything through the same channel. So I think by opening things up this way, allowing many more things to happen at once, we can accelerate the pace of development within Debian much more. So if there are, if there, are, I mean, without yeah, if there are questions for Matt or further, we can do that a few now, and then we can come back a little bit at the end. So there are a few. So Anand has one. Yeah, there's Anand up in the corner. Yeah. Um, so one of the key phrases you just said then was that we shouldn't view um, Ubuntu um, as essentially a bug. Or um, he said derivative distributions in general. I mean, but, 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 but to me, in particular, um, the Ubuntu distribution is different because it, it, it seems to view, for example, the new maintainer process as a bug and it has its own masters of the universe um, procedure where you can also be a maintainer of a package that's in Debian, but you can have a, a separate maintainer for the same package in the masters of the universe program. How do, you, how do you sort of resolve that if you don't think that's a bug in the new maintainer process? Well, I, it's... Obviously, the new maintainer process does have some problems, but uh, I don't think that necessarily we need to say that because different projects decide to try out different approaches to the idea that it's a reaction to it uh, as a problem in Debian. I mean, uh, sometimes the best way to see a better way to work is to try it. And uh, that's a lot of what we're doing with various social aspects of Ubuntu, is to you know, try something different, see if it works. Uh, we have some freedom to do that, having, uh, being a much younger organization than Debian with less momentum. And so we can 
you know, uh, put an idea out there and just put it directly into practice without, you know, disrupting a lot of work that people are already doing and see, you know, whether, whether it works out. And maybe, you know, certainly some things, uh, things don't always work better, but we have found uh, in some cases that that's a very successful way to, uh, to discover new processes for open source development. And it's, and it's an interesting idea that, 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 I mean, we're talking mostly about, you know, kind of code and how we can share things in code, but maybe we can learn things from other, maybe we as Debian can learn things from, from some, of the, some of the kind of social aspects or organizational aspects that, that different der derivative distributions kind of explore. Yeah, and in the particular case of the, ma the Masters of the Universe team in Ubuntu, uh, they're very interested in, in collaborating closely with, with Debian and Debian developers. There have been a few uh, mailing list discussions about this where there have been specific points of contact on that team for anyone who uh, is interested in that type of collaboration. Uh, so we have two, three. Do you want to, I think I saw Brandon first, so yeah, let's go to Brandon first. <coughs> Um, maybe kind of a strange question, uh, but uh, something I'm c kind of compelled to ask given many of the conversations I've had over the past few months is um, from Ubuntu's perspective, uh, what does Debian do better than Ubuntu, and are any of those things important? <laughs> <laughs> Debian, Debian does so many different things and uh, has been successful uh, at so many of them for a long time. I think Debian is has been the center of so much uh, positive activity in the open source community uh, that is something that, you know, Ubuntu as a, as a, as a project is only about a year old at this point, and we've, we've done certain interesting things, but you know, Debian represents a body of work that, you know, goes back uh, many years, and it's the combined effort of so many people. Um, I think that, you know, Debian, Debian does, most of, most of what Debian does, I think it does excellently. I think it does a great job of it. Um, and the areas where, where we choose uh, to do things differently, you know, many of them are, are, are experiments or certain specific uh, needs that we want to address that have come up in our user community. And uh, again, I, I want to emphasize that you know, difference is, does not imply criticism. You know, if we decide to go, to, if a derivative decides that they need to do something differently than Debian, that doesn't mean that Debian's wrong. Um, certainly not. And, uh, yeah, I just wondering. Yeah. As, as a follow-up, do you um, do you have any ideas along the lines of uh, how we could come up with a kind of? Actually, this is a question for the whole panel. It's it strikes me that what we need is a kind of um, change advocacy process because not every derivative distribution changes things that that makes a change. Thinks every particular change is something Debian needs to do. Uh, for instance, many of the localized distributions that were spoken about um, during Debian Day a couple of days ago, I realize not everyone was here, but um, uh, I've actually forgotten now who made the presentation. But uh, th there was a mention of a great many distributions that were localized. So n not every change that is made in a derivative needs to come back to Debian, but it would be good to have a way to distinctly recognize those that an organization such as Ubuntu or, or Progeny or the... Uh, anyone doing embedded Linux work wants to actually try to advocate and really seriously push into Debian as opposed to us just treating all, all uh, deviations from Debian as being kind of equally either suspect or inherently superior. What are your uh, thoughts on that? Well, I think, uh, you know, oddly enough, to a large extent, I think that's a technical problem um, where if we can find ways and build tools and things to manage uh, all of these changes better, then it becomes much easier to keep track of them and you know, attach metadata to them and things like that. In Ubuntu, we're moving toward using distributed revision control uh, very heavily, and we hope to uh, use that as a, as a tool to um, ease collaboration with Debian in a lot of ways. You know, if, uh, if we can make it very easy for everyone to be looking at the same, uh, to be on the same page and see what's there and why it's there and be able to easily start a conversation about it, I think it would go a long way toward getting the changes into Debian which belong there and uh, you know, do, doing all the things that we need, know need to be done. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we had uh, Martin Kraft. And one more over here. Oh, and then one here, here too. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll try to keep this um, quick. I think um, Ubuntu is one of the Debian derivatives, and it's a special one in that it actually managed to get up to top position in DistroWatch in one year only. 
and it has established, from what I can tell, a very um, vivid uh, community, um, one that is similar to Debian in some ways because there are a lot of people that are excited about contributing. Now, um, actually, some of the um, problems that have arisen have um, recently affected me because people came up to me, or people brought to my attention that somebody is trying to package something for Ubuntu that I've already packaged in Debian. So there, I think there is a bit of a lack of communication here, but that's a, really a side issue. I actually wanted to get to another point, which is, um, is there, are there any plans to possibly change the name of Ubuntu such that it isn't Linux for humans, but it might be Debian for humans? Hmm. <laughs> See, I think, you I think like the, the name Ubuntu. Huh? I have no problem with the name Ubuntu. I think the, the problem comes more from the fact that Ubuntu really um, came in separately or, or people didn't really know that it was Debian. And that was some of the cause, I think, of some of the frictions that caused you know, the Ubuntu people to think they're better than... The, you know, we've seen it all, the, the stuff from the past year. And um, I think that the two, Debian and Ubuntu, together can be a really, really um, powerful combination because Debian does the basis for every derived um, distribution and Ubuntu then actually takes care of the users. And with that, I, I also address what Andreas said earlier on. I don't think that Debian developers should be the missing link between upstream and users. I think Debian developers should be the link between upstream and the distribution world. And then Ubuntu should be the link between Debian and the users. First, let me say that um, you know, I well, there may be some cases where people aren't aware of the heritage of Ubuntu, but I think by and large the community is. That's one of the things that people uh, tend to like about Ubuntu. They like the fact that it's based on Debian. They, they you know, as I was said, you know, there's a lot of goodwill in the community toward Debian, and there are a lot of people out there who would like to use Debian, uh, who really uh, strongly agree with its ideals and its processes, but don't feel that it exactly fits their needs. And I think that's a gap, that's where derivatives, a gap that derivatives can fill very well and take you know, all of the good things about Debian and present them to a group of people who might not otherwise have access to them. Or, or, to, people, or to people that just want different things in different uses. I think that a lot of people up here may, you know, may use a derivative and Debian or multiple distributions or, or something in different situations. Did you have a, um, yeah. I, I would like to add something to uh, Martin. Because in, in, in Germany, the, the Knopics, I, I say Knopics distribution is, is uh, well known, but uh, people just use Knopics and think it is a single distribution. It was absolutely not intended by Klaus Knopper. He just wanted a live CD. And people regarded it as distribution because, well, it works. So uh, Martin is completely right. Our users, the users of Ubuntu, Knopics, or whatever, do not recognize that are using Debian and think it is something different. And I think we could profit if the users would at least a little bit educated about this fact, what is behind the scene, and this would bring all projects uh, something forward. If I can address a little piece of that also. Um, there are two sides to the problem of uh, a, d a derived distribution. There's the technical side where obviously the bits are different um, you know, Ubuntu is different from Debian. Uh, Progeny is Progeny Debian. Uh, Componentized Linux is different from Debian. And then there's the social aspect, um, the question of community, the question of um, how users relate to each other, how they relate to their parent. In the case of derived distributions, how Ubuntu and Progeny relate to Debian. Um, it's these. I think the social problem may be a little bit more of a difficult thing for derivers to deal with, uh, it's a little bit more intractable. Um, to the extent that a derivative distribution creates a community of its own, it sort of seems like it subtracts from the Debian community. Um, and there can be a little bit of a tension there. Um, the question that I think a lot of people seem to look at is if Ubuntu's got this vibrant, awesome, cool community that's doing all these great things and has all these experiments that are succeeding so well, why do we need a Debian community? Uh, and from a Debian point of view, that's a very threatening thing to think because we think, well, you know, is Ubuntu taking over Debian? Is um, project, you know, and this is, and I'm picking on Ubuntu here, but this is not specific to Ubuntu. It's something that we deal with all the time at Progeny as well. 
Uh, to what extent does progeny take away from Debbie? And when we, you know, sort of toot our own horn and talk about all the great stuff we're doing, um, especially since progeny is also in the business of doing RPM-based distributions, it kind of can be a threat. Um, I think the I don't know that there's a really good answer here, except to emphasize again the fact that communication, cross-communication is vital to ensuring that uh, the social aspects of deriving a distribution uh, and creating communities around you know, changes and, in a sense, implicit criticisms of Debian do not turn into a reason to drive wedges between people. Um, if we can do that, um, I'm not sure that we have all the answers. I'm not sure Ubuntu does or really anyone else, but it is something that should probably be thought about more clearly. Cool. All right. Well, we have a, I mean, we're going to have to, we're, we're running a little short on time, and there's a couple people that are going to reiterate a few points. So if you can make a quick point or yeah, question, uh, that would be excellent. My, my point is but related to what Matt Duck said about uh, calling it Debian for humans. I think there is a problem uh, in also in, in that particular point of view because uh, right now I'm receiving uh, mails and bugs asking me to, to update my packages in Ubuntu, which I don't work for. So I don't know. I mean, I, I would like to ask everybody in the, in the round table, like, what can we do to, to actually either uh, strengthen, strengthen the links between derivatives and, and Debian so that packages from Debian get into those derivatives quickly or what can we do to actually differentiate them so that people know where to address a concern instead of going to the, the mail that, that shows up in the, in the package? Well, I mean, att attribution is a, 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 tough, a tough subject um, because you've got on the one side, you want to give everyone credit for the work that they've done, right? But you don't want to imply a relationship that doesn't exist. You don't want to give them too much credit. So, so, um, and and I know that I've seen in a couple communities, I've seen people upset because of both things. So, getting that middle ground can be a little tough. I don't know if someone wants to answer that quickly. Yeah, I, I would have said a lot of the same things. This, uh, the same issues uh, have been discussed on uh, Debian Devel in the past. It is a very, it is a difficult problem. I'd like to, if you have a specific suggestion uh, that we can discuss here. Uh, I'd like to talk about that, but later, um, later on, not here. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have uh, really quickly. We have a really short comment, and then I'm going to allow these. I'm going to allow these guys to say a couple things quickly, and then I'm going to throw out something in just a minute, and we'll be done. So. Yeah, um, just a quick comment. Basically, uh, we've already heard uh, a few people c complaining about their packages being out of sync between Ubuntu and Debian. Now, the funny thing is that looking at my own packages already, the way things are repackaged and mostly, basically, strictly rebuilt, wouldn't it be more convenient for everybody if uh, Ubuntu and Debian had a common input queue? <laughs> Uh, incoming sees, uh, and then basically share the exact same packages except in cases where there is customization being done. I mean, from my perspective, as far as I can tell, the main difference with, let's say, uh, the standard GNOME setup we have on Debian and the one on Ubuntu is the human team. Aside from that, okay, during Warty, it, there was things were grossly out of sync, but now with Hori, we pretty much have the same desktop. Uh, now Xorg is also entering uh, GCC4, so at this point, both distributions are more or less out of sync. The main difference is the teaming and the fact that Ubuntu focuses on the very smaller pool of package that they guarantee will go on that CD. So um, my suggestion basically is, can we have Ubuntu be that uh, customer front end that ensures that we always get Debian CD1 ready with the packages that are most desirable from the user's point of view, not the developer's, and have Ubuntu market that, basically. Um, that's, if, if I understand you correctly, that's a, that's a pretty, that's, that's a complex issue. Um, do, maybe we should have a discussion uh, later about that one-on-one, because I know that Mako has other things he wants to talk about. Yeah, okay. So. Oh yeah, there's another, there'll be another session about Ubuntu specifically, so we don't have to answer all the Ubuntu questions right now. Yeah, we do have to answer all, <laughs> all of the derivative distribution questions now, though, so. Yeah, but we should focus on the issues that affect. Because we can't talk stuff. about this afterwards, so. Um, all right, so I'm gonna give, uh, I'm gonna give two more people, to kind of, maybe if we can kind of briefly reiterate the stuff that's different, since we're running a little short on time. Sure. Sorry to cut you off, but yeah. 
Go, so, go ahead. So, um, yeah, my name is Roger So. Um, I work for Samuel Linux in Hong Kong, which is uh, started off in two, year 2000, 2001, and been involved in that since very, uh, very near the beginning. Uh, we, right now we have a distribution uh, based off Debian Unstable, uh, focused on the uh, x86 desktop use. Um, why do we use Debian? Uh, it's technically superior, I think everybody here agrees. Um, so why don't we just use Debian? Um, I think it can be summed up into one word, um, usability for our users. I think it's shared, um, the problems are shared among um, other distributions as well, like uh, Ubuntu and Skull Linux. Uh, usability in terms of the installation, in terms of sensible defaults, in terms of uh, things like uh, uh, having the right input methods for our users, and many input methods that are in common with uh, pop, the most popular input methods in, in use in China are unfortunately uh, uh, patented, and um, most of the uh, really uh, usable and pretty uh, fonts that are used, uh, are Chinese fonts, are, are, are unfortunately not non-free. So, and we had to pay licenses for to to use those, um, and so on. And installation, we have uh, we're we're based off a very early snapshot of the new DI. Uh, we we created a GDK front end for DevCon for it and uh, removed uh, remove many questions uh, during installation. So now it only asks, I think, three questions before it installs. Uh, sensible defaults, uh, uh, little things like uh, uh, the fonts displayed. Uh, uh, users want fonts like from point sizes 12 to 16 to be non anti alias. Um, Little things like that, so um, uh, customized. So that's the only reason why we are not using uh, Debian uh, as it is. Oh, and, and another thing, because we are focused on an x86 desktop, um, having 14 CDs uh, for our users is uh, not very uh, impressive for our, for our users. Um, impressive, not in the way well, yeah, it. it's impressive. <laughs> uh, we have 14 CDs for only like $200, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, lessons learned, uh, communication. Uh, I don't think we have done, so at Sony Linux, we haven't done enough to communicate with um, the wider Debian community, but also the Debian com community itself. Um, it's, I, I don't know, it doesn't seem to be very receptive from, um, it's not very easy to communicate to Debian. I think that's, that's about it. Okay, so I'm going to, if I can cut off questions right here, and then have a, uh, we'll just give a little bit of a, okay. reiterate the parts that you can speak slowly. So, most of the things I would have liked to speak about have already been spoken about, so I won't repeat them many times. Um, we chose to use Debian because we think it's an excellent platform for us to deliver our solutions. Uh, we're primarily looking at server-based solutions rather than desktop, so issues such as fonts and usability and input methods, which would be relevant because I work in Japan, are actually not a problem for us. Um, one of the main issues uh, I guess we saw initially was uh, configurability, um, being able to, for instance, use DebConf universally across all packages, which is just not possible right now. Uh, for instance, partly through our development cycle, we discovered that the NTP uh, package had had DebCon stripped out of it because it was not working. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, things like the Debian installer and being able to pre-seed it, that's excellent for us. One of the reasons we decided to derive was, <coughs> was touched on by Roger is to uh, basically have less questions as people install, um, also to have it default into the Japanese language at the install, so basically to make that experience much less painful for the user. Um, and we've been pretty successful in doing that with very few modifications to the packages themselves. Things like pre-seed allow us to do that without having to, in a very uninvasive manner. Um, moving forward to where we are today, I guess the two major issues that we have uh, is firstly the release cycle. Um, about the beginning of this year, it became apparent that we weren't going to be able to uh, get 
very many customers excited about using a Woody-based distribution because it's too old. Uh, because of that, we've basically been shipping Sarge or Sarge pre-releases since the beginning of the year. Um, Sarge has come out now, and we're very happy about that, but the cycle is just a bit too long um, and also far too unpredictable. I mean, at the time I started working on this, it was about the time that we thought Sarge was about to come out. Um, <laughs> I think it was nine months later when it actually came out. Um, and the last thing, which is um, a bit of a hot topic, but clearly an issue for us and probably all derivers, is security updates. Um, so being able to do that in a more timely basis. We have taken a fairly extreme approach towards only supporting a very small number of packages. So security issues are less frequent for us, but it's still very important for us. Um, that's all I really wanted to speak about. Thank you. All right. So, so uh, all right, before I turn this over, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I think this has been a really good conversation. But we are out. We are, we are getting close to being out of time. Um, and it's, I guess I got the, my, my red <laughs> sign. Um, cue the sign. Uh, so this is a conversation that I'd like to continue, both among these people and among people who couldn't be here. I'd like to bring in some other people. And... Um, um, and in the Debian community, and I think I think that I think that the place to have this conversation is in the Debian project because um, I think that I mean it's because Debian occupies a unique space in this distribution. I mean even even Ubuntu, which is probably the most certainly the most like I don't know the most diverged uh, uh, derivation up here is still you know the the amount of work that's being done is 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 dwarfed by the amount of stuff that's going on in Debian. Um, and I think that we all have a lot to gain um, from working together and from continuing to bring these, to bring these up, these issues. There were a lot of people mentioned communication problems, that it was, difficult to, it was difficult to bring a problem to Debian. Even if you're involved, it's often difficult to bring, like a, you know, uh, to, to, to bring a major issue to the project. Um, and I've got an idea of maybe kind of continuing this conversation in creating a space in the project, maybe a, a, a council or a, I don't know, a list or something, a, a space for, a space for um, I've, I've tentatively called it the, the Debian Derivers Council, and, and, but the idea is that, that, that maybe creating a space in the project for uh, the people up here, for, pe for derivers that are working inside the project, for derivers that are working outside the project, to kind of create best practices amongst themselves, um, to document the process for other people who are maybe less less involved in Debian so far, and to and to uh, kind of uh, communicate as a group to the project, because I think that 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 you know working together we can kind of make our demands uh, demands known, or, our, or at least our common problems known to the project. And I think you will do this or else. <laughs> <laughs> right, so so we're all going to get together and we're going to and we can we can we can we can beat up on on the rest of you together. So 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 I, I have a I have a kind of proposal for for I don't know a, a more formal space in the Debian project to continue this conversation, um, and I'll send that to I guess Debian project in the next in the next week or so, and then hopefully we can maybe continue some of this conversation about how that should or should not work um, in the near future. So there were a few questions that I, people have been. Uh, kind of itching to do. Um, we'll do that quickly and then call it a day. So maybe we don't have time to take new questions, but there'll certainly be spaces within the rest of this, uh, within the rest of the conference to talk about it. We won't call it a day, we'll call it lunch. <laughs> oh, we'll call it lunch. Okay, so uh, Enrico, I think, was first on the stack. Um, which is, well, m rather like a, m an issue I want to bring up. Uh, many of the questions that have been asked to CDD is like how the CDD wants to contribute back and then people fearing that they do something better and they would like hide Debian in the dark and stuff like that. And I, I was asking myself, I mean, uh, I was realizing kind of that, that we, we start having an attitude in Debian which is like expecting other people to do things. <laughs> Uh, like people posting as like, hey, th this should be solved, this should be done like that. But actually there's like a much smaller percentage of people who's actually trying to fix stuff. 
I see it with DevTechs, like I was like, I can't find packages, so let's try to find a solution. And two years later, well, something starts showing. And there's so many people like telling me, oh, I, I would really like to see that in DevTechs. And I'm like, do it. That, that's, I mean, I, I'm just trying to get it together, right? And, 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 and this do it is kind of missing. And so w what, I, what I'd like to see more is like if a CDD does something right, well, let's pick it up uh, and do it ourselves without like hoping like, hey, you made a patch. Could you like upload it in Debian as well or something? Well, no, I mean, you made a patch. I pick it up and I put it in my package and my package is better. And I'm happy because I didn't have to figure out the patch myself. So uh, rather than asking what the CDD can do for Debian, <laughs> like ask what Debian can do for itself. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and use that. I mean, we could suck it proactively, what they are doing. I mean, they are doing stuff. Let's yep. pick it up. Let's steal it. But we should be aware that there is at least uh, four different points of view from the Debian, Debian derivatives uh, that I've observed at least. We have the um, Debian is upstream. We don't talk to them. We just take the packages and keep quiet with uh, doing whatever they are doing. I think that's the Knopix and Linspire kind of way of behavior. Then you have the, the we are Debian derivatives, where Debian Med, for example, is a good example. They don't want to derive, or they want to they don't want to walk too far away from Debian. They want to have everything in Debian. They want to work within the Debian community to improve the packages. Debian EDU want to be there, but we are not at the moment. Then you have the Debian is upstream. Uh, let's talk to them and communicate and try to get our changes back. That's like the progeny and Debian EDU approach. And then you have um, Debian is a friend, which I get an impression from Ubuntu. They, if we can cooperate, that's good. If you don't have time to work with me, we'll do whatever we want to do and go on with it. If we want to share, if we can share information and knowledge, let's do that. If you don't have time to look at it, my stuff, we'll just do it anyway. And these are different approaches to the derivative process, and we should be aware of the differences. And another thing I wanted to say is that um, a lot of uh, uh, problems in Debian have been uh, exposed by the um, recent uh, derivative um, uh, from Ubuntu. I think that's not a bad thing as such, because the problem was in Debian already. We already had bottlenecks. We had uh, too much dependency on individual developers who was uh, too overworked and too overloaded and had different priorities and we needed to solve those issues sooner or later. And we are hopefully in a position where we can try to solve them now because they are very visible and we have done quite a lot the last year to uh, fix a lot of these issues but there are still some left and we, should, uh, we shouldn't complain that uh, like Ubuntu is bad because they exposed these problems. These problems were there already. So, so yeah. Another thing. Uh, um, Matt mentioned all the uh, noise on the mailing list. I've experienced from the school Linux effort that the uh, people writing a lot on the mailing list do not do much work in the project. And uh, <coughs> <laughs> there is a saying in, in Norway about this, uh, empty barrels make the most sound. And I think this is true in most projects. So even if there is a lot of strong opinions in the mailing list, that doesn't really mean the active participants in the projects share these opinions or think they are really that uh, important. So keep that in mind. Okay. And yeah, Jeff, quickly. Um, I wanted to bring up, in contrast to Enrico's point, I wanted to bring up the uh, flip side of it, how the Debian uh, derivatives sometimes have a problem. And in doing this, I want to sort of uh, highlight something Matt Taggart uh, sent to me an email. Uh, some of you know I'm working on the LSB work, and I had made a proposal about something regarding that. And Matt basically posted back and said, you know what, I really don't like this attitude because, you know, you're, you're the guy working on the LSB stuff and you're saying that you're going to present this for approval and who, who, who's going to approve it? And, you know, why do you feel like you have to be separate from us and do this all separately and differently just because you're a progeny? And I think he had a good point. A lot of us in the derivative world uh, sometimes feel a little bit separate. You know, we can debate whose fault that is or if it is anyone's fault. But um, again, this sort of highlights the important point that we do need to f we, we do need to de-emphasize the fact that we're all derivatives, which means we are us and you are you, and never the twain shall meet. Um, 
and emphasize more the point that we are really collaborating and working together on things. So, so uh, if we can do that, I think that would be a good okay. improvement. Um, so, yeah, so, so I want I, uh, we're like over already, so. Only one short question. Okay, quickly. Every Debian developer knows if Scholar Linux is using his package. Um, this is one point uh, I want to uh, I want to add to what uh, Enrico said, because um, I didn't know that uh, there are packages of mine in Ubuntu. Well, I should have, but. I got a report for one of my package um, that was saying, yeah, it's fixed in SID already, um, but not in Ubuntu. Um, I just could reply, well, thanks for telling me that I'm doing a good job. But um, the thing I want to address is um, what Enrico said, um, we often don't know that uh, the custom, uh, that the every uh, distributions are using our packages. There's a lack of communication, um, but not only in that way, but I think there's often not really a communication with our own upstreams, so it's not only a lack of the derivated distributions, but, on, but also of ourselves to our upstream maintainers. Right. Um, this we is a very good point. We never told directions. the maintainers that we use their packages, right. and I guess we should. So, so that's and finding out how to do that is maybe something we can talk about later. Uh, um, so, 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 but but Enrico and and, and others were absolutely correct. Um, part of my part of my goal here is to kind of compl complicate the idea of responsibility and shifting this responsibility of 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 you know a, a, a derivation is something that we all have to you know a a strong ecosystem where people give back to Debian. And where we can, and, and where people give back to Debian, and Debian can take from them, is something that benefits all of us. We all can benefit from all of these users and people, you know, users and developers who are using derivative distributions. We just need to figure out how. Um, so there was a, there was one. I'll take. Can I take your, your one word? You don't want to do your one word, okay? Uh, then the last one from uh, Jesus. Hi again. Uh, yeah. It's working? Okay. Uh, well, I, I would also like to say that I'm representing, in a way, uh, the uh, Nokia people that came here today. We're trying to build a Debian-based uh, tablet uh, for internet browsing. And we have also a derivative uh, thing. We should have been on the table, but I, d I couldn't figure out who could be there on time. Uh, and I just wanted to stress that one of the things that makes uh, Debian so strong, that is like the, the diversity of people that are collaborating in, in it, it's also the thing that sometimes makes it really difficult. We're not a company, so we're not a single po point of failure or success. So every one of us has its own opinions, its own uh, ideas on how to create a package, how to upload the package, and how to convince other people to do the things they, the way they want it, the things to be done. And that's the thing that we have to like stress. From my point of view, is one of the things that makes this project so amazing and so powerful, but at the same time so like worrisome that when you want to get into that project, you know that, that you're gonna have to face lots of problems, lots of different opinions, and lots of different variety of packages that, that you have to then tweak and go and modify it because there is no common thing to work with. And that's one of the things that we actually found in, in, in the process of creating this, this product in, in Nokia. And that's... All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for showing up. And thank you to the panel for uh, sharing your experience. Give everyone a round of applause. All right. So let's, uh, let's continue this conversation on, uh, on project and over lunch. So.